Anyway, so the title of this um, uh, session is uh, the UK Space Agency uh, towards 2030. Um, it's a really short but hopefully sweet session where I'm going to update you on uh, our strategy, some of the recent things that we've achieved, and some of our plans for the future. And maybe there'll be a little bit of time at the end for a couple of questions. Um, so, um, where has the UK come from in space? Um, well, we were the third spacefaring nation, the third nation to uh, put a satellite up into space in 1962. Um, we were very much involved in the European Launcher Development Organization, ELDO, um, with the various black knights, prints, etc., um, which was, of course, the first stage of that very early European rocket. Um, the UK then um, really stepped back from rocket development in the early 1970s, focused more on science, um, joined um, ESA as one of the founding members in 1975, and played a relatively quiet role, but an important role, for the next um, 20 to 30 years, um, which takes us to 2010, when the growing importance of the commercial space sector um, was noticed um, by ministers, um, uh, Lord Sainsbury, um, and then uh, David Willits, of course now Lord Willits, who was the science minister at the time. Um, uh, he took the view that um, the UK needed a space agency. Um, uh, we had for some time had a uh, an agglomeration of space activity within the various bits of the administration under the British National Space Centre, which did many good things, but it was not um, uh, a separately constituted organisation. So the UK Space Agency was founded in 2010, um, and there were a series of um, strategies and plans worked up at that time. Uh, and it was at that time that a target of capturing 10% of the world's space um, market was set. Uh, for the UK, which we've been working to ever since. Um, so the UK in particular, over that period of time that I described, has developed uh, very great strengths in uh, communication satellites and telecommunication satellites. So um, we uh, reckon we build about 20% of the world's communication satellites, or at least launch them um, through companies like uh, Inmarsat. Um, uh, we uh, build about 25% of the world's communication satellites, um, mainly by Airbus. Uh, so roughly about 25 to 30 communication satellites being built for the geo orbits uh, a year, Airbus building about a quarter of those. And then, of course, we've had the um, uh, amazing development of Surrey satellites. Um, who have captured an enormous part of the small satellite market between roughly 10 and 100 kilos. And then in more recent years, the emergence of CubeSat manufacturers such as Clyde and obviously the arrival of Spire, which was very much welcome. So uh, the UK has been very active in satellite construction. Um, most recently, um, Surrey University themselves, out of which Surrey satellites were spun uh, many years ago, um, had uh, the amazing, uh, amazingly successful uh, first trial of its removed debris satellite. If you haven't seen uh, the video out on the uh, net uh, showing a net capturing a piece of debris that was uh, deliberately thrown out there to be, to be hauled back in, I really advise you to do it. Actually, I think it's beautiful. It's just amazing to see how this net uh, behaves in space as it envelops an object. Uh, so as much as anything, you should look at it for its artistic merits as its scientific and technical ones. Um, one of uh, the uh, big focuses for us as a space agency since we were formed in 2010 has been collaboration with um, the commercial sector. So we were very fortunate already to have Airbus uh, as a very strong player in the UK market. Um, but we've also looked to foster other uh, companies. So Thales Alinea Space has um, more or less doubled in its size over the last two or three years. But there are lots of other smaller companies, especially in space applications, which are developing very rapidly. So to take one, for example, Resitech, who are a very innovative um, Earth information applications-based company, um, they've told me that they've roughly doubled every year for the last few years. They're now up to about 50 people, and they're moving into a purpose-built um, accommodation in Harwell um, to accommodate further growth. Um, so some very exciting um, uh, changes going on there. So. Um, 
I mentioned um, our focus on 10% of the world's space market. Why do we want to achieve that? Well, I suppose you, know, you are the converted, so I don't really need to preach to you, but uh, it's self-evident that the space industry has an extremely high productivity. So in the UK, it's about two and a half times the average productivity of the workforce. Obviously, some of that reflects the very high capital investment in the sector, but a lot of it is down to the very high intellectual capital of those that work in it. Um, so as the UK aspiring to remain uh, a well-paid, um, high welfare, high productivity economy, we want to develop sectors like the space sector in the UK. And there are very good arguments why government should support the space sector. Um, very R&D intensive, uh, about 8% of profits in the sector are returned to research and development. Um, a lot of new technologies coming through. It's often difficult for the companies or the uh, research organizations that develop that technology to secure all of the benefits of the IP or the spillovers, so a good uh, argument for government investment. Um, we've also seen through our own national space technology program over the last few years that government investment can really hope help get over that dead spot on the technology readiness level um, curve, as it were. So we have been focusing our investments in the two to four range. Um, uh, a number of businesses have very successfully um, taken um, basic engineering concepts and turned them into products or at least put themselves in the position of being able to win grants from people like ESA off the back of that technology development program. And they simply would have struggled to find uh, investment from other sources had it not been for the government. So we can really, um, by investing in space, secure an extremely productive um, uh, sector of the economy, uh, which is good for us as uh, individuals in the UK, but also good for other sectors such as agriculture, transport, the financial services, and health services and education. So it's not just about economic outcomes, but also social outcomes. So what are some of the things that we've been doing very recently? Well, um, we have been focusing on launch in the UK. If you were following the Farnborough International Air Show, you will have uh, noticed that we announced uh, grants of £31.5 million to support the development of a spaceport in Sutherland, in the north coast of Scotland, uh, which um, is well placed for polar orbit launch over the North Pole, um, with Lockheed Martin, a new company called Orbex, and the Highlands and Islands Executive, who will be uh, building uh, the spaceport itself. Um, we're also supporting that through um, the development of new regulatory standards. Um, it's obviously important that we should launch safely, securely, responsibly. So uh, in March this year, uh, the Queen gave royal assent to the Space Industries Act, um, which will now be converted into a set of regulations um, enabling us to regulate launch um, appropriately. Uh, and just this Monday, we announced um, uh, a regulatory streamlining of our uh, satellite um, uh, licensing application process through a, a traffic light system that will essentially make it a lot easier for low-risk um, uh, missions such as um, CubeSats into orbits below the level of the International Space Station to get licenses rapidly and easily from us. So we see regulation is very much an enabler of the market there. Other things that we're doing, we're investing in Harwell. So Harwell over the last six years has become an amazingly important part of the UK space sector, um, both, as I say, in applications, such as I just mentioned with Resitech, but companies like Oxford Space Systems have been developing innovative um, uh, upstream hardware with this amazing flexible boom. If you haven't seen it, uh, I urge you to uh, either look on the internet or see it in reality. Uh, this thing basically flicks out. It's a very clever little bit of uh, carbon fiber technology. Um, and of course, um, we are investing in satellite testing at Harwell. So we are putting 99 million pounds into a new satellite testing facility, which will either be able to take very large satellites or um, uh, enable the calibration and testing of a series of smaller satellites at the same time, which is very helpful in terms of the calibration process. Um, other things to mention um, uh, are our partnerships. So as uh, it won't have failed uh, to escape your notice, we are leaving the European Union, but we're not leaving ESA. Um, and it's very important for us that we maintain a strong membership of ESA. After the referendum, we in fact increased our 
contribution to the ESA budget, um, committing 1.4 billion um, pounds over the next uh, funding, uh, sorry, 1.4 billion euros, not quite the same thing yet, um, 1.4 billion euros over the next funding period. Um, and we have been really proud to be associated with some amazing uh, recent projects. Uh, I was um, privileged to attend the launch of Aeolus, French Guyana, uh, in uh, August, which uh, was primed by Airbus in Stevenage. I think uh, the fact that um, NASA gave up on uh, a satellite to measure wind speeds is testament to the uh, achievement of uh, the ESA and Airbus and other teams involved in that satellite, and it's already producing amazing data. Um, Gaia, obviously, uh, incredibly important mission mapping uh, the Milky Way galaxy, um, which integrated uh, a one million pixel camera built by ETV in Chelmsford. Um, uh, and with teams in Cambridge supporting the um, European-wide um, data processing activity there. Solar Orbiter has just been shipped out of Stevenage. Uh, I think it's now in Germany uh, for its environmental testing and will obviously uh, head uh, off for launch um, uh, sometime over the next sort of 12 uh, to 18 months. Very, very exciting mission uh, studying the sun. And then, of course, we've been very important players in Copernicus, which is partly uh, an ESA project, but obviously partly um, uh, and mainly a European Union project. So um, other key partnerships for us are global. Uh, we're very um, excited about the partnerships that we have with NASA. Um, so we're very much involved in the James Webb Space Telescope with a MIRI instrument that's being uh, built up in Scotland, um, which will launch in 2020. And um, we're very excited by the Australian uh, Space Agency and the opportunities that that uh, offers for collaboration. Um, we signed an MOU uh, yesterday uh, signaling our intention to work together. So um, the other thing that I would like to just mention about uh, space in the UK is our international partnerships program. So space has an unrivaled capacity to address um, issues uh, and deliver solutions in areas where there are um, widely dispersed uh, populations and limited existing infrastructure. So it's an extremely useful um, technology to address development challenges and challenges generally in developing countries. And we've been lucky enough to work with some amazing companies and amazing countries over the last few years in developing that program. So to give you uh, various examples, um, we've been looking at um, uh, disaster management um, and recovery from floods uh, in Africa. We've been looking at, um, Airbus has been looking at um, generating um, robust tax revenues in, in Africa again by properly um, managing uh, an understanding of um, uh, development in cities. Um, we've got a project that's going to look for illegal gold mining in Colombia using artificial intelligence to distinguish clearings that are associated with that activity from other clearings. Um, so some really exciting applications out there that we're proud to be involved with. So um, uh, going forward, uh, I really see this as a, a golden age for space generally, but especially for space in the UK. Um, we're keen uh, to write the next chapter. Um, we remain an extremely ambitious space nation. Um, uh, we are very excited about, uh, as I mentioned, a number of missions which are uh, planned uh, shortly. Uh, to take place. Uh, and before I finish, I'd just like to mention Bepi Colombo that we're involved with, um, which carries an instrument built by the University of Leicester, an X-ray instrument, and of course, the Mars rover, which will be launched in 2020 uh, and is being assembled in Stevenage to look for life on the red planet. Finally, before I finish and uh, we take any questions, if we've got time, I'd just like to plug our space conference in Newport, uh, which is happening between the 9th and the 11th of July uh, next year. Um, the last event, I think, was almost twice as big as the previous one, so um, we're really looking for it to be uh, even bigger and better uh, this time. Uh, I'm sure it will be, and it would be delightful to welcome you there. Thank you very much. So I think we've probably got a couple of minutes before the conference staff uh, close down, so probably take two or three questions. So anybody want to ask a question? One over there. Uh, 
Um, yes, uh, so um, the location is a place called Tung. It's the Anvoin Peninsula. It doesn't look like it's pronounced Voin, but apparently that's how it's spelt in Gaelic. Um, it is um, going to uh, be supporting um, a relatively small launch, so perhaps 150 to 200 kilo payloads. Um, that could be either one large satellite, or relatively large small satellite, or the other thing that we're very interested in is launching CubeSats. So Lockheed Martin are working with Moog to develop um, what's been called an orbiting, orbital maneuvering vehicle. So I'm calling it a space taxi. Basically, it'll take a series of six U CubeSats and really place them precisely in the orbits that they want to get into. Um, uh, so as I say, there's two companies, Lockheed Martin looking to launch, but also Orbital Express, that are a relatively new company that's developing their own rocket. So that's what's uh, happening in Sutherland with the aim of really getting launch in the early, very early 2020s. Great. And uh, I was wondering what kind of traffic you, you were envisioning there? Well, I think initially perhaps one launch a month would be a good kind of cadence. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, there may be uh, the opportunity to increase that. Um, we'll have to accommodate um, the uh, air traffic that... Uh, is quite sort of heavy in that area, but, but we think it's perfectly um, reasonable to have a commercially uh, sustainable uh, launch cadence. Do you mind if we pass on to somebody Thank else? Thank you very much. Hello. Um, hi, over hi. here. Uh, Great. You got the microphone. Um, I uh, hear that um, the UK is contemplating building a British navigation satellite system. Um, how um, likely do you think this is and how realistic? Uh, well, likelihood is quite a difficult uh, judgment to make, isn't it? Uh, I mean, one of the key factors is whether we are able to negotiate continued participation in the Galileo program, because if we do, then we wouldn't build our own system. Uh, at the moment, I would say that is not looking terribly likely, um, because we've uh, set out um, the needs that we would have in participating in that system, and that includes um, continued industrial involvement. At the moment, that's being excluded uh, through the security um, uh, perspective. Um, we are still in negotiation. Um, we would like to continue to participate. Obviously, we've contributed a lot to that program, um, but we would need to see some move uh, on the part of the Commission in the U27 on that industrial participation um, uh, uh, side of things. Thank you. OK. Perhaps time for one or two more questions at the back there. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Chloe. I'm from Canada. I wanted to know, what is the UK plan for the deep space gateway around the moon? Has UK interest in that project? And if so, could you tell us more, please? Yeah, absolutely. So very interested in that project. Um, we are um, a growing contributor to ESA's exploration program. Um, typically, in the past, um, we tended to be stronger on the um, uh, robotic and non-human side of exploration. Um, and um, we see particular UK strengths in communication. So Deep Space Gateway will need communication both with uh, the moon itself and with Earth, and we think there's an opportunity for the UK to be very much involved in that. It could be that um, there would be a uh, GNSS system around the moon. Again, you know, we may be very well placed to uh, help with that, uh, given our um, work on the Galileo program to date. Um, and obviously, we'd be delighted to have uh, astronauts up there. We've got Tim Peake uh, on, the ESA, uh, on the ESA team at the moment. Uh, so uh, that would be amazing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe time for one more. And I think then maybe the conference staff will want to throw out gentlemen over there. So, so hello. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Guillaume like, from the Association of French uh, Aerospace Industry. I, would, uh, I have a question on the specific like catapult uh, space application initiative. Uh, I would like to, I would really like to have like your uh, feeling about uh, how the initiative has like really putting a dynamic in your ecosystem until now, mm -hmm. and what are the perspective like from your point of view the future of this initiative? Yeah, so I think the there was a review of the the catapults generally. I think it's available online. Um, and that included um, a review of the satellite applications catapult. came out, I think, about a year ago. It's very positive about the satellite applications catapult and what it had achieved. Uh, and um, I think it's no small um, uh, credit to the catapult that um, Harwell has developed as rapidly as it has in the last six years. That's certainly, I think, substantially down to the catapult being there and, and really helping forming connections between um, both the companies 
at Harwell themselves, but also companies and potential um, customers. The Catapult's also really extended its reach beyond um, Harwell, so it has a number of regional, um, uh, uh, regional offices, the northeast, uh, in the south, in the east, and, and, and in various other places up in uh, Scotland as well. So I think it's been extremely uh, effective. It has, it doesn't get a, uh, it gets a relatively modest amount of public uh, investment. So actually, one of the really good things that it's doing is it's generating some income itself, and that is helping it do its work. So by and large, I think I would certainly recommend it. Uh, we were inspired ourselves by the Fraunhofer Institutes. Um, uh, and I think if other countries are thinking of something similar, then uh, uh, we'd be very flattered if they were to uh, copy us. Okay, I'd, I'd ask the conference staff whether they, they want me to finish now or uh, whether there's time to go on. Are we? Okay, one more question. All right. Anybody else? A gentleman in the front row. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I have a question about the spaceport. And how many launches per year are you expecting to have in the future? So as, as I say, I think we've sort of started with uh, an assumption of about one a month. Um, uh, that looks like it would be commercially um, viable. Um, but there's no reason why there couldn't be more than that. Or as I say, you know, it's a fairly kind of busy uh, airspace. So there would come a point eventually where there might be conflict between um, the needs of commercial airlines and launch, but we don't see that uh, really as being a problem when you're talking about that kind of cadence. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm very grateful for your uh, attention.